This is a cell, and this is its powerhouse, the mitochondria. The mitochondria is the powerhouse of the cell is one of the most repeated refrains from American schools. There's only one fact I can think of that even comes close to matching the beloved mitochondria. And that is, of course, the famous Pythagorean theorem, telling us that if A and B are the legs of a right triangle, and C is the hypotenuse, then A squared plus B squared is the power is the uh, C squared. Now, what your teacher probably didn't tell you is that the Pythagorean theorem is mid, and I'm going to prove it to you. You see, there is a long beloved practice in mathematics called solving a triangle. This is the art of taking things we know about a triangle and using that information to find out other things about the triangle. For example, here is a triangle, and like all triangles, it has three angles. If I tell you that the measure of this angle is A degrees, this angle up here is B degrees, then I bet you could tell me the measure of this third angle. Indeed, any master of solving triangles would know that the angles have to add up to 180 degrees, so this third angle must have a measure of 180 minus A minus B. That's easy enough. If we know two angles, then we can find the third angle. But what if we only know two sides of a triangle? Maybe we know this side has a length of A and this side has a length of B. We don't know the angle between them and we don't know anything else either. Then how could we possibly find the length of the third side? Well, the classic Pythagorean theorem gives us a way to find the third side when we know the two shorter sides. We just have to take a square root on both sides and we could find C but this only works when the angle between sides A and B is a right angle, 90 degrees. Now, with only two sides of the triangle and knowing nothing about the angle between them, our power is gone. What can we do without our mid-theorem to bail us out of this pickle? Well, we can't do anything at all. If we were somehow able to figure out the third side just from knowing two other sides, well then, we would know that two sides fully specify a triangle, and that's just not the case. Knowing two angles of a triangle doesn't fully specify it either. It does force the third angle to have a particular measure, but the triangle itself could be smaller or bigger and still have those three angles. Of course, two sides don't specify a triangle because they could have a narrow angle between them like we see here, an acute angle, or the angle between them could be quite obtuse, maybe something like this, where this is A and this is B, and we of course get a much different triangle. Okay, so what if, like with the Pythagorean theorem, we do know the angle between our two sides, it's just not 90 degrees? Here's a triangle, and we'll name its three vertices A, B, and C, and as is tradition, we'll name the sides opposite the angles with the lowercase of the corresponding letter. So this side is opposite angle A, its name is little a. This side is opposite angle B, so it's little b, and this guy over here is little c. Now suppose we only know three pieces of information, just like with the Pythagorean theorem. We know the length of this side, we know the length of this side, and we know the measure of this angle between them. From this information, can we find the measure of the third side? Well, of course, the Pythagorean theorem is useless here if this angle is anything other than 90 degrees. Thankfully, though, there is a much more rugged result that we can use in just such a situation, and it's called the law of cosine. And this law actually looks a lot like the Pythagorean theorem. It tells us that c squared is equal to a squared plus b squared minus 2ab times the cosine of the angle between those sides a and b, which we are calling uppercase c. The history behind this law is very interesting. It wasn't written in this modern form until the 1800s, but one could argue that it was proven as far back as 300 BC, but that's a story for another time. 
I don't intend to give you an introduction to the cosine function here, but if you have no clue what it is, it's a function which takes angles as inputs and it outputs real numbers between negative one and positive one, depending on the value of the angle. One important fact is that cosine of 90 degrees is zero. So in the right angle case, where we could use the Pythagorean theorem, the law of cosines does apply, it's just that cosine of 90 degrees is zero, so this term disappears, and what remains is the mid-theorem. But the law of cosines isn't just reserved for right triangles, it works for all of them. And let me show you how easy it is to use. In this example, we know the lengths of A and B. Let's say the length of A is three and the length of B is four. And we also know the measure of their included angle. Let's say that the measure of that angle C is 30 degrees. That's an acute angle. We absolutely can't use the Pythagorean theorem here to find the length of this side, but the law of cosines will help us solve this triangle in short order. It tells us that the length of this side C squared is going to equal A squared, which is nine, plus B squared, which is 16, minus two times A times B, so two times three times four, so 24, times the cosine of 30 degrees. And running the numbers on this is no trouble at all. Just bust out your trusty limited edition transparent green TI-83 plus and crunch the numbers. Nine plus 16 minus 24 times cosine of 30. And we get about 4.2154. But remember, this is c squared, so we're going to want to take the square root of this in order to finish solving for c. And thus we get 2.05. And how about that? No Pythagorean theorem, no problem. This is a crucial law to know when it comes to solving triangles. Yet, you may still sense some weakness here. Remember how we've said that this angle C has to be the included angle. It's the angle between sides A and B. That's when this law applies. What if we know two sides, say A and B, but we don't know this angle between them? Well, again, there's nothing we can do in that situation, but what if we do know an angle, just not this one? So perhaps we know that the angle between B and the side that we don't know, maybe we know that angle is, let's say, alpha degrees. We certainly can't use the law of cosines like we just did to find the third side. Is the law of cosines mid two after all? Well, in fact, you could use the law of cosines here to figure out this third side. You'd have to use it a bit differently, but it can be done. However, in the interest of covering some more interesting stuff, there's a much more modern result, also crucial for solving triangles, that can be used in this situation. So here's a lovely little triangle, and we're going to suppose that we know the length of this side and this side, but we don't know the measure of the included angle. Instead, we know the measure of this angle opposite side B. In this situation, we can use a result called the law of sines, which I'm going to give the honor of being written in the luxurious metallic sharpie. The sine function is another trigonometric function, like the cosine function. It takes angles as inputs and outputs real numbers between negative one and positive one. And the law of sines tells us that in a triangle, the ratio of a side to the sine of its opposite angle is constant for all ratios in a particular triangle. So A over sine of angle A, that's the same as B over sine of angle B, which is the same as C over sine of angle C. Now this is a lot of power for one man to hold, so it's good that we're sharing it. And how can this be used to find the third side in this situation? Well, we'll actually have to apply the law twice. Let me show you. Let's say again that A has length three, B is four, and we'll say that this angle, angle B, has a measure of 103 degrees. This known information should look pretty promising because it's three pieces of info. When we look at the law of sines, we could take any two of these expressions, which are equal, and note how any two of them will have four total pieces of info. A, C, sine A, sine C. A, B, sine A, sine B. 
So take any pair where we know three pieces of information and we can solve for the missing fourth one. In our case, we'll want to take A over sine A, which we know is equal to B over sine B. We know every piece of information there except for sine A. Thus, we would have three divided by sine A, which we don't know, is equal to B, which is four, over sine of angle B. And of course, we know that angle B is 103 degrees. You can do what the kids call cross multiplying. Four times sine A, we'll put that on the left side of the equation. And this must equal three times sine of 103 degrees. Then to find sine of angle A, all we have to do is plug this into a calculator and divide it by four. So going back to our trusty limited edition transparent green TI-83+, plus, we have three times sine of 103 and then divide this by four. That's about 0 0.7308. Of course, we want information about the triangle. We wanna actually know what angle A is. So this is where we will use the inverse sine function, also sometimes called the arc sine function. Take the arc sine on both sides and we'll figure out what angle A would have to be to have 0 0.7308 as its sine value. So coming back to the limited edition transparent green TI-83+, plus, we do inverse sine of the answer we got before, and we get an angle measure of 46.95. For convenience, let's just call it 47 degrees. Now this is going pretty well because we have two angles. We know what angle A is, and we know what angle B is, and so we can now find angle C. However, some of you may be noting potential for an issue here because in fact, 47 degrees is not the only angle that would have this sine value. It's a property of the sine function that sine of any angle, let's say alpha, is equal to sine of 180 minus alpha. For those of you who know the unit circle, this identity comes from the fact that it's really just a reflection across the y-axis, so the y-coordinate, hence the sine value, is not changed. For example, here's alpha in the acute case, and then here would be 180 minus alpha, and the y-coordinate is the same. So then how do we know that the correct angle here is 47 degrees and not the supplementary angle 133? Well, if this was 133, we would immediately have a problem because angle A plus angle B in that case would exceed 180, which has to be the angle sum for any triangle. So certainly the angle here has to be 47 degrees. It absolutely can't be 133. That would be too big. Okay, so no worries then. Angle B is 103. Angle A, we're gonna say is 47 degrees. And so just like that, we know what angle C is. B plus A is 150, so C must be 30 degrees, bringing the total to 180. And now that we know angle C, we can use these two expressions to solve for side C. You would do the same thing we did before, except now the unknown piece of information is C. I'll leave you to crunch the numbers, but in the end with that second application of the law of sines, we would find that the length of side C is about 2.05. However, there is still trouble afoot and you should be feeling somewhat sick and uneasy in your stomach. What we just went through was knowing two sides of a triangle and a non-included angle. And from that information, we fully specified the triangle, found all the sides, found all the angles. But that shouldn't be possible, right? I mean, think back to your triangle congruence theorems. When you learned about triangle congruence, you probably learned about things like side angle side or angle angle side. If two triangles have corresponding sides equal and the included angles equal, then they must be congruent. If two triangles have two angles equal and a non-included side, then they must be congruent. Now, what you didn't see was this. Uh, let's call it side-side angle. You didn't learn about this as a congruency postulate. Even if triangles have two sides congruent and a non-included angle congruent, that doesn't mean that the triangles are congruent. 
but doesn't that contradict what we just did? We just said, hey, look, we have two sides and we have this angle that's not included. And so there's only one possibility for the triangle, which would mean that side side angle is valid. Well, it works in this case, but not always, which is why it's not a congruency theorem. Let me show you an example. Here's a triangle, and let's say the information we know is this angle here, and we know these two sides. I'll call this angle alpha, and let's say this is side C, and this is side A. If this is going to serve as a counterexample to side-side angle actually being a thing, then it should be possible to construct another triangle that has this side, this side, and this angle, but a different third side. And indeed, it is possible. Just imagine this base of the triangle continuing. Now imagine this angle between sides A and C opening up. It gets wider and wider, and naturally the length of this side that's going down is changing. It gets a little bit smaller and a little bit smaller, but then eventually it starts getting bigger until at some point it's once again going to achieve that length A. And this angle will still be unchanged, but the third side will be much bigger. Instead of looking at my ugly sketch, here's what it would actually look like. A second triangle satisfying exactly the same conditions. This angle alpha, this side C, and this side A, but a completely different third side and a completely different angle here. Now, like we said, this ambiguity doesn't always exist. And in fact, you can get a sense of when it's a problem just by looking at this sketch. The necessary conditions for this ambiguity to exist are that this non-included angle alpha is acute. So it has to be less than 90 degrees. The two sides which are known can't be congruent let's say that A is smaller than C, since that's how we've drawn it here. And A can't be the height. Sorry, I accidentally wrote that it's less than the height. It has to in fact be greater than the height of the triangle, this perpendicular distance from the vertex to the line containing the base. A has to be longer than that. And you can see how as we open up that angle, A gets shorter until eventually it would be the height. But then as we continue opening it up, it eventually reaches that length of A once again, creating that triangle. So coming back to that first application of the law of signs, where we were able to disregard a potential second solution for the angle, sometimes you can't disregard that second solution. But the good thing is it is easy to find. One angle is alpha, the other one's 180 minus alpha. Suffice to say though, the Pythagorean theorem's utility in some situations can be quite limited, but that doesn't mean that we are hopeless. We have lots of other great geometric tools we can apply. So remember, the mitochondria is the powerhouse of the cell, and c squared equals a squared plus b squared minus 2ab cosine of c, where c is the included angle between sides a and b. If you like math, check out mathchin.com for the coolest math clothes ever created, and be sure to subscribe for more of the swankiest math videos on the internet. I'm not stable, I'm feeling art to keep the cable cut and untuck the table If Texas instruments don't reply, I think this time it might be fatal Wish to sell my own fake, cause I'm traded Hate the odds that I calculated Press and pull a brain and push it all the way through the whole blue planet Faded Psychosomatic habits, why you're so sick